Hello, and thank you for coming today. Uh, this afternoon, our conservation department and others were going to and other are going to talk about uh, the Walter De Maria trilogies from uh, their point of view. So um, my thanks to Brad Epley, Chief Conservator, Shelley Smith, Object Conservator, and Tom, Head of Art Services, and now, as of now, I guess, Manil, Chief Oil Changer. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Please join me in welcoming Brad and Shelley and Tom. Thanks everyone for coming. Tom and I are going to share this mic, um, so if you have any issues hearing us, please just let me know and we'll try to maximize it. Um, so during the course of fabricating and installing these works, the three of us had the opportunity to work um, directly with the artist and in close proximity with the artwork. And we thought this afternoon, over the course of 30 minutes or so, we would um, share with you some of the aspects of the fabrication, transportation, and uh, installation of these artworks, um, as well as some of the anecdotal information we gleaned from our talks with Walter to maybe give you an enhanced understanding of the physicality of these artworks, um, also an idea of the subtlety and degree of detail with which Walter works in every medium, and finally, some idea of the conservation aspects um, that come into play when thinking about preserving works of art such as the Bel Air trilogy, which incorporate, um, for lack of a better term, found art objects, uh, and that's in this case, uh, 1955 Chevy Bel Airs. Um, while we're in the foyer, I thought I would talk first about the paintings. As a paintings conservator, those are the ones with which um, I have the most um, direct contact with Walter. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the color men choose when they attack the earth uh, is a painting from 1968. It entered the Manil collection in 2006. Shortly after we acquired it, Walter came down and we had a series of conversations about the condition of the painting at that time. Um, most of the condition issues it had then were related to its size. At about 25, I mean 20 feet wide, um, it had to be periodically rolled, um, the stretcher collapsed, and then all of it put back together and restretched um, as it changed ownerships as it went to installations before it entered this collection. So because of that, it had several um, cracks and some deformations of the canvas, and also the stretcher was really designed to be um, easily taken apart and was not designed so much for with the stability of the painting in mind. So through discussions um, with Walter, he identified some of the condition aspects that he found disturbing and he wanted us to try to address. And over the course of the next two years, we worked with the painting in the studio to um, not only address uh, the aesthetic concerns, some of the cracking, some of the canvas distortions. There were also some previous fingerprints from handling, but we were also able to build a new stretcher for it that would support it adequately. Um, and also now that it had entered this collection, um, we would be reducing, if not eliminating, the need to ever roll it again. So we were able to form a much better and stable um, uh, base for the canvas. Based on those conversations, when Walter came to create these two new paintings for this exhibition, we uh, kind of reinitiated our conversations about painting. Um, he was very much interested in creating um, new paintings with a similar surface quality to the old painting. He wasn't interested in making something new and distressing it to match the old one, but in terms of gloss and um, other aspects, he wanted them to be harmonious with each other. So um, both in New York, uh, while he was in New York, we had several email exchanges, and then over the course of some trips to New York, we evaluated some paint outs where he had adjusted the gloss of the paint, the thickness of the paint layers. Um, again, he's very concerned with degrees of subtlety, and I think that's why all of his artworks are, um, give the perception of, of perfection, um, and, and it's because of those fine tuning of details, and he is clearly interested in the nth degree of the materials that go into a work of art. So we spoke um, ultimately about, you know, made decisions about the thickness of the paint, um, the amount of gloss medium to um, make the degree of finish, the matteness or the glossiness similar to the pre-existing painting, um, and also the thinness um, of the paint layer. He was very interested in the fact that the canvas show through, that these be um, clearly identifiable as paintings and not just some kind of painted uh, surface. The same attention to detail also went into the fabrication of the plaques. 
We had lots of discussion about the degree of polish, uh, the size of the fonts, the depth of the engraving. Um, it was really interesting, I think, to, to see him with all of these different um, options available to him and uh, him sorting out the, uh, the different degrees or the aspects or the physical qualities of each of these that, that he felt was, was vital to the work and ultimately resulted in the, in the paintings that are here. Um, in addition, just one final thought, about, um, in addition to all the details about the material aspects of the painting, he was also very concerned about the shape or the composition of them. While both paintings are in themselves individual paintings, their outside dimensions were determined by this space and by their relationship with this painting. So as I mentioned, this one's 20 feet wide. These two new paintings are each only 14 feet wide, again, um, with this very specific installation, the Manil Foyer in mind. Um, the heights have been maintained the same, but um, it's that balancing again and the fine tuning of details, I think, that of every aspect of the construction of these that, that comes through in this installation. So I think now we'll go down and um, Tom and Shelley can talk more specifically about the cars. So if you'll join us down there. One other um, point I wanted to emphasize before we go on is um, while Walter was very interested in talking about the material details of his artwork, he's not interested in talking about interpretation or intent, those kinds of issues. Um, and I think that'll come out as we talk a little bit more about um, the cars itself. So the conversations we had were about, um, in talking with Walter about material choices, the, de the final decision was always Walter's and the application is always Walter's. He's just, because he was working remotely trying to um, match the similar, or trying to have the paintings be similar in certain features with the one that exists here, we had these degree of conversations. But um, again, he, he's a highly engaged in the material um, specificity of these works. So I'm going to pass over to Tom now who will talk about certain aspects of their transportation and um, installation. Um, these were sort of an interesting challenge for us because while we have a number of very large works and sculptures in the collection, um, most of them come in smaller parts and, uh, or are packed in crates or, you know, generally shipped and handled in a very different manner than these. Um, the big problem we first realized was due to their size, how do you get them in the building? Um, because they are 16 feet long and 8 feet wide and, um, and they're nothing but surface. There's, there's nothing to handle them by, essentially. And, uh, and luckily, because I think on, on um, one level, because Walter is so materials-oriented and sort of detail-oriented, um, he's also very pragmatic about the materials themselves, and so he... Um, they never ceased in a way to, they never ceased, oh, there we go, never ceased in a, in a way to um, uh, no longer be what they are, which is they are 1955 Bel Airs. And so um, the happiest day, I think, in the planning of this show for me was when I was told, of course they can roll on their wheels. They have wheels. And uh, that made everything, I think, much easier for us. Um, however, they did ship here on, uh, basically on a car carrier, on a private car carrier, and, um, which is very different than how we normally do things. So we had to uh, unload them on Mandel, just on the other side of this wall, and roll them in. Um, but because of their size, they actually wouldn't fit through our front door, so we basically had to arrange for contractors to come and for, I guess, about the span of five minutes, remove the front doors so that we could bring them in. Um, and then because they're each approximately 3,000 pounds, um, there's an issue of weight load distribution through the building. And uh, whereas this gallery, because this was always envisioned as the, as the regular uh, changing exhibition gallery, is, is a reinforced um, area, our foyer is not actually built for that. So we had to sort of disperse the cars about the, uh, the foyer and the hallway so that we didn't have too much weight in one area, essentially straining the floor. Um, 
and then we were able to bring them down here again because of the size of the, of the sculptures and the size of the door. We had to take off parts of the doors and actually lift them off their wheels to maneuver them in, to line up on the doorway and then push them through where they just basically just barely go through. And, um, and then because of the nature of the weight of their risers, um, the risers are basically all in place, so you have to kind of maneuver around the bases and then build what I keep calling an Egyptian ramp um, to actually roll them up onto, onto their bases. Um, so it was a very, very different installation um, than any I'd ever worked on before. Um, and luckily, I think it went absolutely as smoothly as possible. Some of you were, I think, here while we did that. And, um, um, and then from there, it was basically the, the longest part of it was basically getting all the details right, getting everything spaced and everything where, where Walter wanted it. And um, Walter has a sort of a very mechanical and mathematical um, sort of problem solving way that's really kind of brilliant to watch because we got to see that over the course of the lead up to the show. And, and so he's very specific. And I think that, as Brad mentioned, that, that plays out with this sense of perfection in the work. And um, so really the hard part was actually just getting them finished once they were in place. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, I don't know, if, is my mic on? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the challenges you encountered after the installation? Yeah, well, because, um, because of the nature of, of the material, um, they have all the problems you would expect of a car, and uh, and particularly because these, you know, because you know, Walter I think did such a an extensive job of of, of getting them back to this condition. Um, you know, these weren't these didn't start as showroom cars. Um, everything as they fare now was done by the artist, and it was uh, they were returned to this condition and. And uh, so we found along the way that they all had their own sort of personality. Um, we had oil leaks because they are, there's an engine under each hood and, and um, you know, brake fluid issues, things like that. And, and a minimum of these materials or these fluids were, were left in them because they have, they have to move, they have to maintain certain functions. And, um, and in fact, when, when we were maneuvering them in, we did have somebody um, who had worked on them during the, the creation of the works uh, in the car, uh, steering and using the brakes. And so we had to have that kind of level of functionality uh, to them. And the uh, problem is once you then get them here and they're no longer moving, some of those fluids like to find their way out. And um, I think luckily I've learned everything I needed to learn about cars after <laughs> that, and, uh, and those are no longer issues. I just wanted to add one thing about the, the fine tuning of them, and that is about their sculptural qualities. Uh, to, they're interesting because they are simultaneously cars and they're simultaneously sort of ready made sculpture. And one thing that had not really dawned on me is um, the way Walter was very interested in making sure the internal components of the car were aligned in an artistic way or in line with his vision for these works. So that meant things like adjusting the suspension so that lines, so that the chrome lines read a certain way, adjusting the springs within the seat so that the seat lines read a certain way, um, the line of the dashboard, the read of all the different components of the car are um, seemingly infinitely manipulatable, manipulable and, and to the extent that they were, they were modified once they came here. Walter had worked with um, uh, a group of men in New York who helped him um, refab or, uh, refurbish the cars, and they were the ones who were really um, well-versed in, in what could and couldn't be adjusted on the car and spent essentially the next three or four days after they were installed aligning or perfecting the installation of each, of each piece. Yeah, we, we had two people who had worked with, uh, with Walter in New York, um, again, getting these to the state they're in, who then came down and and, and literally just sort of spent the next few days inside the cars, getting everything right, going around, making sure every, you know, everything was, was the way it needed to be. Because um, while they look the same, they're not the same. No, they're all, I mean, they really... Sorry. Um, as 
I said, come on. As I said, um, they do really have their own personalities, and it was sort of fascinating to see because at a glance they all seem like very much, you know, an addition. And um, and so it it was it's been a very interesting kind of journey with them. And um, so Tom had an opportunity to learn more about intimately when he got underneath the cars the individual history of each car because they were, according to Brad, acquired at different points of time and obviously from different locations and different parts probably uh, And too. I think in different, very different states. Yeah. Um, so, um, I th yeah, there was a lot of, I think, manipulation all around to get them to be what they are, to get them to be, you know, as, as similar as they are. And um, I spent quite a bit of time under some of these. Um, it's really not something I'd ever done with cars before. I'm not a car guy, and so this has been an, a learning experience. Um. Does anyone have any questions about the cars themselves? Or? Well, they're always so shiny. Does some little elf come in with a shiny each night and wipe them off? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we dust them, but they're not outside and exposed to the normal elements, so the way they came in with their finish, surface finishes, how they came in, and, but they, but they get very dusty, so nope. all we do is dust them off. Well, when, they, when they originally arrived, oily. basically they looked, they looked more like a sculpture of a car than a car itself, because everything was wrapped other than the wheels, and a one window, I believe, was left accessible for somebody to climb through, like Dukes of Hazard, and, um, and because everything had to be protected in transit because that was when they were the most vulnerable, particularly because unlike most art, they weren't shipped in crates. And um, so once they were all unwrapped, that was a, a large part of that, getting everything lined up and, and showroom ready. And since then, you all have dealt with the keeping them dust free. Yes, um, <laughs> and fingerprint free. Yeah. The glass, the front glass and the back glass, is it glass or is it? It's not, it's not, it's, it's um, exactly. Uh, because of, um, I think, b the weight bearing and everything, they, I, I think Graham said hundreds of ones were built to get it right because they have to be precisely cut. What's the clearance between those? Uh, I, I think two of them are, are incredibly snug, I mean, less than a sixteenth of space. And then I think one, they had, uh, this one I think has a little more play in it. And it was uh, due to the fact that of the construction, I think, of the, uh, of the square rod itself. Um, because they were welded, because they weren't, they weren't cast, they were, um, they were welded. So there, I think, is heat distortion in, in that one. Um, but you can't so really see unless you really try. Um, and they, they were traveled with these in place, really? yeah, and uh, which was great for us because that was, I think, our greatest fear is, yeah. you know, having to feed those through. Um, and uh, people inside and outside and I yeah, and and I know um, one of, one of the two uh, men who came down from New York to work on these with us um, uh, apparently did. Um, certain degree of fabrication because there's no way really to use plastic to, you, you can't cast plastic, I think, in the same way that you can glass. And so um, I think they really had to work to make everything fit together the way it would if you were just using an original windshield. Um, and to get, yeah, to cut holes in those glass in, in original windshields, they would have gone through, they would have had to have found a lot of windshields and yeah. gone through a lot of those, so. Yeah. And polycarbonate uh, looks very convincingly like glass. It's used in airplane windshields, so it has a, the same uh, transparency and, and sharpness, uh, optical clarity. Uh, how old are the pieces? Uh, when were they refurbished? Uh, well, I think the refurbishment, um, the, the works were all finalized in the months leading up to the exhibition, so they are very fresh. And this is their first travel. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. one more travel to leave here. They have to mm -hmm. leave here, yeah. Yeah. 
You were saying that he owned one of these cars for quite some time and then acquired the other two later? Um, he hasn't said whether personally he actually... Oh, no, no, I think as, as far as the actual sculptures, oh. he... Yeah, I believe he, for he conceiving purchased of the piece. two of them, I think, originally. The idea, I think, is much, much older than I, I had realized, and, and he was able to find two of these, I think, about 10 years ago, he said, and then about the time we started talking with him about doing this exhibition, he was able to find the third, and so he was able to, to make that really the focus of, of what he wanted to do with the show. Um, so I think it was an idea he'd had years and years before he actually found them, and then, so it was a long time in the making. Carl, did you have one? Do you know anything about the color? Um, I mean, was that a standard shade it, combination? It, it is, there were, I think, eight two-tone, um, color options in 55. That, I, that you might know a lot more about. My guess is it's a custom mix based on um, on the original colors of the cars. I think so. I remember that was one of the problems they were having was making sure that they all matched yeah. and that they all matched what would have been originally available because through their lives they Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are original, or they are meant to replicate the original. The question actually brings up another interesting, or at least interesting to conservators, the idea of um, ready-mades and how you preserve those through time. For the cars, we have the good fortune of there being a kind of whole sub-industry and culture of classic car enthusiasts, so a lot of these materials and parts we can guess will be available. Um, for a while at least, just because you know, there's a wide body of people that are interested in keeping those things around. But Like the tires? Like, like exactly, the size tires, um, hubcaps and other specific details of these cars. Mm -hmm. What happens as you get further and further away from the original time period of these cars is those components become rarer and rarer, and they have to be um, kind of one-off manufactured, which in some respects takes away a little bit of the way from the idea of, of, of it being a ready-made or a an industrial off-the-shelf component. But so these kind of considerations are always um, things that we think about uh, when we acquire works of art or when we're thinking about the longevity of components of, of works of art such as this. Anything special, you were talking about the perfection of the three being together. Anything special about the inflation of the tires? You have to check those from time to time? Tom you? does, yeah. Yeah, um, they're actually overinflated so that they have a, a particular look. Um, I believe all but one side of one of these are at 50 PSI, which is considerably higher than its actual trial. Uh, they've actually been really consistent because the environment, you know, there's so little fluctuation in temperature here. Um, uh, definitely if, you, if they were outdoors, it would be. Or driving down the highway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they don't go through the heating and cooling process, your tires on your car do, and so they've, they've been very stable. Uh, the rubber will, of all the elements on the car that, is, that are visible, the rubber just will inherently begin to decay before anything else. So keeping them inflated is also really important to preserve them as well. So out of the sun. Out of the sun, yeah. But rubber is self-catalyzing, has self-catalyzing deterioration too, so they will have to be replaced uh, at some point. Uh, one is about the restoration. Are they restored only aesthetically, or could these cars actually be driven? They're fully they are. Yeah. Okay. You put and all the fluids in them, they're, they're fully functional. Okay. And my other question is about sort of, it sounds like the mini all had a large role in the con maybe not the conception of these works, but in commissioning them and maybe funding them. Um, is that, would you say that these works were commissioned, and is the mini all acquiring them, or what's the mini all's role? Claire can probably speak, but there's n yeah. not a commission. I think it was a, the content of the exhibition was generated you know, by Walter and, and um, Joseph was interested in working with Walter and through the course of their discussions of the kind of exhibition they would have, this is the artwork that, that resulted. This is what Walter was working on. And,
On a boat? On a boat, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think that's also being worked out. Yeah. I think they're actually, the plan is to create them. They didn't come here created, but because of the number of steps, inf you know, many more steps involved in getting from um, here to Italy as opposed to New York to Houston. So they'll actually be created, like regular artworks are created in um, three enormous crates. Um, so. <laughs> Walter and Brooke Stroud, our exhibition designer, um, yeah, spent a long time lighting essentially the space around the cars as well as the cars themselves. So um, it's really a, a fully, um, it's an installation really. The whole space has been considered the lighting. Um, so it's the space that's lit and the artwork itself too. So, And there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussions about the quality of the light, the kind of light bulbs, et cetera, that went into creating this particular wash of, of light on the walls. This, I, think, um, I think this is also the first time in about as long as I can remember that we've had a full open skylight ceiling. Um, because of the nature of the, the ceiling, you can get a lot of natural light and it can get very brightly very quickly. And uh, artwork is inherently light damageable. Damaged by light. And uh, so this is, I think, the first time we've ever had all the skylights open, plus the, uh, the upper windows, um, which have, in the entire decade that I've been here full time have never been opened. Um, it was really, I mean, Walter really, he had, he had a specific idea of lighting as he did for everything else for the pieces. And uh, so. Yeah, so it's one of the short term compromises that we make. In normally, a gallery would be a dark space. But um, this is a fairly short exhibition, and it was important. The lighting was important to the artist, so. Well, and I think he, he didn't want it to look like a showroom. Mm -hmm. He didn't want it to look like an auto show where the cars are so well lit and nothing else really seems to be there. And that wasn't. He didn't want everything to break down to these individual sort of little gems in a space. And, and it was very much about the space they're in, so. Anyone else questions, or? Yeah, one more question. You talked about the ma mathematical perfection of Walter. Any commentary about the odometers, since he had to refurbish everything, did he reset them or oh. reset them or something? Actually, you know, I have no idea. I have, I have never looked at them. Um, I mean, he's leaving as they were found and stopped running and left odometers at that point. I, re I really I couldn't say. I don't know. Yeah, I would actually have to look in there and see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would, in a way, I would be surprised if, uh, if they're not all the same, because I think probably so much uh, went into the sort of vitalizing them that they might very well have new matching. We don't we don't know if the odometer matches the engine in the car or yeah. if they were, yeah. One of them is uh, manual and two are automatic. We did notice that due to the help observations of. Katrina Bartlett over here. <laughs> so we're learning new things all the time. It's it's not that he's not interested. He he doesn't want Someone, someone else's interpretation, even his own, to, inter to be part of the consideration of it. It's, it is about, it's the artwork that speaks for itself. have at least 10 meanings so he doesn't want to um, he doesn't want to pin down any one and have that one sort of overshadow what any of the other ones could be so thanks Claire so 
if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you all for coming. And um, yes, we'll also be here if you have additional questions off the mic. So, and thanks again. <laughs>